14 tales told by a Dubliner be Turlock on me. Story 4 The Banshee of the Craigs My mother's family, the Craigs, were a well-known family in Derry, active in the textile business. But their father died at an early age in pneumonia, contracted on a fishing expedition out on Loch Foyle, and the partition of Ireland in 1922 cut them off from their natural hinterland in Donegal. In fact, the family came from Donegal originally. But now the family and business, led by the widow Craig, with the help of her surviving brother-in-law James, decided to leave Derry and move down to Dublin. They set themselves up in a fine house in Ratgar, a genteel suburb with tree-lined streets, and did their best to adapt to their new circumstances. But the business didn't go well, and there was no one among the sons who could take over and run things. The eldest, Joe, was a cello player, and other brothers were all musicians too. They appreciated their easy living, but had lost interest in the hard work that had made it possible. Their only interests were in the arts, especially in music. Joe, the eldest, who played the cello, was going on to study music. Oscar and Louis played the piano, and Jack played the violin. So music ran in the family. They were all musical. Well, their father hadn't been much, but Uncle James made up for it. He was a professor, not only of Irish, at St. Eunan's, letter Kenny, but singing too. He made many settings for voices and piano, the old Irish songs that he knew from his childhood, or had heard from the old singers. Now, by this time, he had retired from teaching. The young Craigs had all grown up in Derry. Moving all the way to Dublin, a strange city, was hard for them. They all had to find new schools. Annie had one teacher who used to make her talk to the class because she liked to hear her accent. Derry was definitely home. Their mother was a Derry-born woman. Margaret Daly had grown up as the daughter of a well-to-do publican, and had married Dennis Craig, who had come in from the country to work in the textile business. His family were from far out in Donegal, from a place called the Glenties. Sometimes the family went there on summer holidays, but that all ended when they moved to Dublin. In 1929, Mrs Craig died one night at the house in Radgar. She had been ailing for some time, but when it happened, her death was a shock to the family. They were all numb, from the eldest, Joe, who was in his mid-twenties, to the youngest, my mother, who had just turned sixteen. As always in times of crisis, Uncle James was sent for. He was retired from St. Eunan's Letter Kenny, and he'd come to live in Dublin, also in Ratgar. He came around right away. Uncle James was a small, slight man with steely grey eyes that seemed to divine what was on the minds of those who spoke to him. He always wore a neat dark suit and a bowler hat, and he had a waxed moustache. When he arrived in this house of weeping and wailing, he was deeply affected by the death of his sister-in-law, which he knew must mean the end of the Craig household sooner or later. But he endeavoured to confront the situation stoically, feeling that all were dependent on him as head of the family. He consoled the grieving nephews and one niece as best he could. He dealt with the practical matters of placing an announcement in the newspapers and summoning the undertakers, and then left, promising to come back the next day. The spring evening darkened into a long blue twilight around the stricken house. Joe attempted to practice or play a little on his cello, but his heart was sick and he had no will, seemingly, to bring forth music. 
Late that night, when all were gone to bed, he heard a sound outside the house that filled him with a sudden sense of dread. It was a woman's voice, faintly singing or chanting, and he couldn't hear the words, but he knew what this must be, what he had often been told about in accounts of wakes in Donegal among grandparents and relatives there. It was Keenan. Out there in the countryside, it was considered proper to mourn the dead be keen in them, that is, be singing an improvised chant of mourning and lament. At the wake, and at the funeral which would follow the next day, women members of the family who had a talent for this would keep up intermittent keening over the departed. Now, as many families did not have such gifted persons, it became common for women in the locality who were so gifted to hire themselves out as professional mourners. And these women kept up a dismal lament adapted to the characteristics of this particular departed, which others invariably found gruesome but appropriate. However, this practice was also known to have a supernatural dimension. There were many tales of keen in women of supernatural origin, often three in number, who would appear and mourn the dead person with unearthly wailing that would make the gathered mourners feel as cold as ice and almost drive them to the edge of madness. It has often been said that those who mourn cannot adequately express their grief, but these women, being supernatural and age-old, could express every human grief exactly in a way that chilled you to the bone. They were called Nimnabana, the white women in Irish. Need it be added that these traditional mourning chants known to the real women of the countryside were all still in Irish too. What this corona a legend went back to was the figure of the Banshee. Now, Banshee means just a fairy woman. But she was thought to be a supernatural figure who specialised in Keenan, for she appeared whenever someone died and kept up an unearthly dirge for several nights in a row. Not everyone who died got this treatment. It was reserved for certain ancient and distinguished families. Only they had their own banshee, or had the privilege of having the banshee come to them. All these things flashed through Joe's mind as he heard the woman's voice, things he had not thought of for a long time, things he knew of but had scarcely thought of much before. Then all seemed to be silence. That is, he heard nothing but the motor traffic on Ratgar Road and the odd horse and cart clip-clopping boy. He had been mistaken. There was no voice keen in it had just been his overwrought nerves. He smiled wanly to himself in the semi-darkness. Then the smile froze on his lips, because it had started again. The Keenan. The woman's voice could be heard quite distinctly. It rose and fell, died away and then rose up again, full of sorrow. Joe crept to the window and looked out. He could see no one there. He wanted to open the front door, look outside, walk around the house, but he dared not. The sound died away. This time it stayed away. He was relieved, if you could call it that, for the rest of the evening, and busied himself with tasks so that he wouldn't have to listen, wondering whether he'd hear the keening or not. Eventually he felt easy enough in his mind and tired enough to go to bed. It was near midnight. Sometime in the middle of the night, he woke up. He judged it to be about three. Outside the house, he heard a woman's voice keening. That was what had woken him. It was wailing, rhythmic wailing. No, it was a song. It was sometimes wailing, and sometimes it was song. It rose and fell. And it wasn't just screams or wails. No, it was a woman's voice singing, almost speaking. And he could hear she was articulating words. She was reciting. 
but it was in a language he didn't understand, so he couldn't grasp the meaning of what she was saying. How strange that he couldn't understand it. How strange that there are people who live and die, who laugh and mourn, who talk and sing, and it's all in a different language, in a different world. You could be looking through a great glass window, and that would be as close as you'd get. No walls keeping you apart, as if in different rooms or different houses. No, just glass between you, a different language, a place you didn't belong, and they didn't belong with you. So you went on living in different worlds. But you saw each other, just like the neighbours he saw every so often, he reflected, though he hardly knew them. The voice sounded pure and unearthly. Did no one else hear it in the house? And the neighbours? What must they think? He fell asleep again, unable to do anything, and the voice sang on. The next day Uncle James was around to meet the undertakers and make the arrangements with them. Just one man came this time. He was a grey-haired man. He shook hands with Uncle James and with Joe, and he said, Deepest sympathy, I'm sure, with a sort of professional sincerity. He must do this every week, thought Joe. He saw people dead and, and them getting buried. He knew all the secrets that were involved, what you saw and what you didn't see. He was old enough, and no doubt it was a family business. This man knew all about death. He lived with it. He didn't get on with his life, as they say, after the funeral. This was his life, and he was growing old in it. One day he too would die, and someone else would make the arrangements for him. He talked about the arrangements with them now in a quiet, matter-of-fact way. The undertakers would come the next evening with their hearse and remove their remains in a coffin to the local church. The remains, no, he said, Mrs. Craig, would remain in the empty church all night and then the funeral mass would be the next morning and then would be the final procession to Mount Jerome Cemetery, which was not far away. He had a plot already identified for her. Joe imagined a fresh grave being dug. After the man had left, Uncle James stopped to talk with Joe. They went and sat again in the parlour. Uncle James, the frightened young man, blurted out when they were alone. Last night, yes, last night I heard the banshee. Can that be? Uncle James was clearly taken aback and looked for a long time into the fire. At last he shook his head slowly. I don't think so. That's an old story. It wouldn't happen down here in Dublin. Yet I heard it. Do you believe me? Of course, my boy. But probably you were just a wee bit overwrought and, and thought you were hearing something. He added softly. It runs in the family. What do you mean by that? asked Joe. Well, the old stories are there. Our family always used to hear the banshee when someone died. But not here, not in Dublin. He shook his head again. Joe looked him imploringly in the eyes. Will you come over tonight and see if you hear anything? All right, my boy, said Uncle James with a sudden air of decision. I will. I'll be over around nine. Then he got up took his bowler hat and walking stick and left the house, still shaking his head somewhat. That evening around nine, as dusk was fallen, true to his word, Uncle James was back. He went and prayed by the bed where his dead sister still lay. Then he joined Joe at the fireside after the younger ones had all gone to bed. They sat before the red coals for a while, talking of minor matters. But suddenly an unearthly wail was heard from outside the house. It was not very loud, and it didn't last very long. But Joe's and Uncle James's eyes met, and Joe knew that he had not been mistaken. Uncle James as yet said nothing. The voice was raised again outside the house, prolonged this time in a long, keen enchant, 
that went on for minutes. It rose and fell. It sounded like a song. And Joe had the same impression he had had during the night that this was not inarticulate wailing, but words, words, lines and stanzas. Uncle James wasn't looking at him now, but his eyes were fixed, downcast. It seemed like he was listening to the song, hearing the progression of the verses, which meant he was able to understand it. He knew. He knew all about it. Joe suddenly thought that Uncle James belonged to a different world from him. Oh yes, they could talk. Thank God they could talk. But Uncle James had once crossed over from that world, and now he was crossing back. Do you want to go outside and see who it is? asked Joe helplessly. Uncle James shook his head. Why not? asked Joe. There's no point, said Uncle James heavily. We know who it is. Who? The Banshee. The Banshee? asked Joe again, incredulously. Aye, replied Uncle James softly. It's the Banshee of the Craigs. But I didn't think she'd come. Not down here. It's so far away from Donegal. But she did. And God keep us. But they know. They know when a Craig is dead. And she's come all the way. His voice trailed off. What do we do? asked Joe. Nothing, said the older man shortly. She'll be here for three nights, or maybe more, and she'll keen the dead woman after her fashion. Just leave her to it. Don't go outside. Just go to bed. They sat there in silence as the keening went on outside. It would go on for minutes and then stop. Joe felt terribly tired. I'll go to bed, he told Uncle James. Thanks for the help. What will you do, though? Are you going to go outside to go home? Uncle James shook his head. No, not now. No one should disturb this. It'll continue until dawn. Then she'll steal away into the morning mist. Tonight I'll stay here. And I'll keep vigil by your mother's bedside. In the morning the undertakers will be around to take her away to the church. Joe watched Uncle James open the door of the death room and go in. There was no one there now, of course. No one but his mother. He vaguely felt that there should be people there. All the people gathered there. All the Craigs and Dailies. But there were none here. He saw Uncle James' small figure go reverently to the bedside and kneel down beside it. He knew his mother was lying there, an extra shape like pillows under a bedspread. How could that be her? Her soul was already gone, quit its earthly mansion. He was too tired to think. He drew the door closed, then he went off to bed and went to sleep heard and faintly the keenan from outside. In the morning when he got up, the sun was shining pleasantly. He looked in the open door of the death room, but by this stage Uncle James was gone. He'd slipped away shortly after dawn. Only the body of his mother lay there, a shape like pillows underneath a bedspread. Later the undertakers came with their hearse. They knew what to do. They brought the polished wooden coffin into the house, and in the death room they busied themselves. Joe saw them carry the coffin slowly out the door and put it in the back of the hearse. The horses waited patiently, four of them adorned with black plumes. He didn't want to think that it was his mother that were taken away. Soon they were gone. That night all the Craig children, from oldest to youngest, were gathered as usual in the parlour after the evening meal. They sat around the fire, making desultory conversation. The atmosphere was gloomy. When it was getting dark, they were somehow loath to depart for bed. Then they heard the keening outside. What's that sound? asked the youngest Annie. Annie, I've heard it too. And I asked Uncle James, 
explained Joe slowly and carefully. It seems it's the banshee. It's nothing to be afraid of. She comes around the house after someone has died and mourns for them. It lasts for a few nights, Uncle James says. So just go to bed and, and don't worry about it. That's the best. Oh, that couldn't happen in Dublin, surely, said Louis. It only happens down the country. God knows there's enough stories about it. Aye, said Joe. But it seems the Craigs are a family that have always had the Banshee to visit at times of death. And there don't seem to be any exceptions. So she's here, the Banshee that is, and she's mourning for Mama. Dear God, said Annie suddenly, what will the neighbours say? Joe smiled royally. Och, they'll probably think it's us. I don't like it, said Louis. Annie and Oscar and Jack nodded. No, none of us like it, said Joe with a sigh. But it seems we have to put up with it. It'll only be for a few nights, Uncle James says. He was here last night to wake Mamma before they took her to the church. Wasn't that nice? I thought it was. That at least one person should stay all night. Anyway, he heard it. The Banshee, that is. He's used to it by the look of things. It's just one of those Craig things. He shrugged his shoulders helplessly. The Keenan went on outside the house very distinctly. But what is it about the Craigs? Why does this Banshee have to come to us? Asked Danny uncomfortably. Well, Annie, said Joe with another sigh, the Craigs go back a long way. We only know Derry, and now Dublin. But before Derry, there was Donegal, you know, out in the Glenties and Inish Keel and by the sea around there. The Craigs were always out there. It seems they were an important family. And they had the Banshee come to them whenever someone of the family died. But what was important about them? Oh, you better ask Uncle James, said Joe. He was born out there, and he knows all about it. He'll come around tomorrow night or the night after. You know, after the funeral. Speaking of which, we all have to be up early tomorrow to go to the church at ten. So let's all turn in and get a good night's sleep. They all murmured their agreement and rose to go to their rooms. The Keenan started again. They just looked at one another, but said nothing. The next day, the funeral mass was at ten. They were all there. Uncle James was the chief mourner. There he was, standing stiffly in front of the church, in his black suit with a black toy and his black bowler hat. They went in. The coffin which had been left at the back of the church inside the doors, was moved forward to before the altar. There were a good number of mourners who turned out for the funeral mass. People they knew from Ratgar. Friends, neighbours. People that knew them through business in town. Joe and the others didn't know who they all were. They felt glad that so many had come. For the Craigs had not been all that long in Dublin, and there was no question of bringing the body back to Derry. Mama was to be buried in Mount Jerome. They went and sat in the front pews. Uncle James was on one side of the aisle, Joe as eldest on the other. Father Murphy, the curate they knew, came out on the altar. He was a serious-looking grey-haired man of about fifty, now he was dressed in black vestments edged with gold. The acolytes were in black soutans and white surplices. He began the funeral mass. Requiem eternam dona eis domine. It was comforting. There was a dignity to the familiar Latin words that Joe saw in the missal in front of him as he followed along. In his mind he set them to music. It was familiar Gregorian, and then it was Mozart, and then it was Verdi. All music and song that he knew and loved. All too soon it was over. 
Father Murphy came down from the altar with his ministers, bearing holy water and incense. He took the smoking turable from the thurifer and incensed the coffin. Then he sprinkled it with holy water. At the end, the undertaker's men came and wheeled the coffin out and put it in the back of the hearse. Joe looked at the coffin. He had a lump in his throat. He'd never see his mother again. He looked around at the family. They looked lost. Uncle James was in command of the situation, though. He stood and received the condolences of the people, gravely nodding, occasionally with a sad smile. The four horses pawed the ground, snorted, and occasionally shook their heads with the black plumes. Joe noticed them, though they didn't look at him, because they had black blinders on. They seemed impatient to be gone. And when they shook their heads with the black plumes like that, they seemed to be saying, It's tough, but never mind. It has to be gone through. It's time we were going. Black motor cars came around behind the hearse, and the family got in. The hearse drivers got up on the box and pulled away over the church grounds. The motor cars followed the hearse. They made their way along Garville Avenue, and in 20 minutes they were at Mount Jerome. Again everyone got out, the coffin was unloaded from the hearse and taken to the grave. Father Murphy took his position at the graveside and read the prayers. His Latin words echoed around the cemetery. They all watched silently, those who had come. Here were no words being spoken. Only the priest had Latin words to say. The coffin had been lowered into the grave and they lost sight of it. They had all stopped thinking that this was the last of their mother. She was gone in the grave, or rather her body, that had lain in the sick room since her death was been buried. Her soul was gone to eternal habitations. The family all felt numb and relieved as they left the cemetery after a final sombre farewell from Father Murphy. Joe felt like a real adult. He was composed. He was burdening himself well. They were driven home in the motor cars and went into the house from which their mother was gone. Yes, she was gone. She was not here. Only memories hung about the place. Or was she somehow still here, Lingerden? Or would she return on All Souls' Eve, like the story said? These were Joe's thoughts, and he wondered if others were thinking the same thing. No one said anything. But old habits took over, and they made themselves a midday meal. Then they all sat quietly in the parlour or in their rooms, reading their prayer books or just thinking. Uncle James did come over that night. They all sat around the fire inside the house, listening to the endless keening outside. Eh, it still went on. They all looked very grave. Why does it have to be? Annie asked finally. It sounds awful, like someone crying. You want to do something to help, but you can't. I just wish it would stop. Uncle James sighed. Then he said, It's all the grief and the mourning in the world that has ever been contained in one song. It's a song that never ends, that's always been picked up where it left off. For people are always dying, and there are always people to mourn them. You can tell from the way she sings that she knows. She knows all about it and puts it into her singing. It's a beautiful song, really, just unearthly and hard to listen to because it is so beautiful in a way that's more than human. What is she singing? asked young Oscar after a while. It's a song in Irish, said Uncle James. Sometimes it's just wailing and moaning, inarticulate but melodic. For grief goes beyond words, and only God understands it. But then there's words too, lamenting the one that's gone. Do you understand it? 
asked Annie. Aye, said Uncle James. I do, for I didn't I grow up with it, speaking the language. Ye don't understand any of it, I know, because your father, God rest his soul, didn't pass on the language to ye when ye were young. And how could he, I suppose, in Derry, where they didn't speak it? And your mother, God rest her soul, couldn't speak it either, because she was a Derry woman born. But a generation ago, the Craig spoke nothing else. He just hears sounds of wailing and weeping when the banshee cries. But I know the words, and they pierce me to my heart. His voice trailed off, and he looked into the fire. How long will this go on for? asked Louis. Uncle James seemed offended, but he mastered himself. Three nights at least, he said shortly. Oftentimes it's gone on for longer than that. He looked around the circle at the wide-eyed young Craigs. He sighed. You'll get used to it, he said finally, and then he rose and went into the hall, took his bowler hat and cane, and opened the door. He waited for a while, and let the light shine out onto the garden path. Then he bid them a muffled good night, and he was gone. After that, things just seemed to get worse. The singing got louder, and it went on for night after night. It sounded like a chorus. One night wee Annie went into hysterics, because she said she looked into the room where Mama had died, and three strange women in white cloaks were gathered around the bed. Joe and the others succeeded in calming her down, but it took a while. After they had persuaded her to go to bed, be an unspoken agreement, Joe and his younger brothers went and sat in the parlour before the fire. For a time they sat in silence in a semicircle, listening to the voice, or voices, outside, chanting and keening. They could hear the words, or pick out a word here or there, and it certainly wasn't English. After a while, Joe spoke. We have to do something. This has got to stop, or we'll all go mad. The others nodded. But what can we do? asked Louis. Could we ask Father Murphy to come over from Rathgar Church? He could do something. Say prayers or something like that. He would just laugh at us, said Joe bitterly, or he'd think we'd all gone crazy. We will be crazy if this goes on, blurted Oscar. Louis looked at him. Then he looked back at Joe. Who can help us? The only one is Uncle James. He knows all about these things. You're all heard. And if he knows all about it, you can be bound that he knows the way out of it. The way to stop it. Well, why didn't he do something before then? asked Oscar. He thought it would just end, said Joe helplessly. Maybe he thought it might be good for us to hear it. Or maybe he thought it would be good for Mama. I don't know. Well, now we know that it's not ending, said Louis indignantly. It's gone on for three nights and more, and it just gets louder. There seems to be a chorus of them out there now. Joe shuddered. It was true, he thought to himself as he listened. There was more than one voice now. In fact, it seemed to be three. They sang, answering each other around the house. Perhaps they'd taken up different stations. They could keep up the responses for long periods, and then they'd trail away into silence. We'll get Uncle James to come over tomorrow, said Joe with sudden decision. We'll just tell him it has to stop, for everybody's sake, for everybody's sanity. We'll just tell him, I'll just tell him, to do whatever he has to do. He'll know. The next day... A telephone message was sent to the house where Uncle James had lodgings. The upshot of it was that Uncle James was prevailed upon to come around. And in the presence of the others, Joe explained to him that the situation could not go on. Uncle James nodded slowly, gloomily, and looked around the fireside circle from the eldest to the youngest. He didn't look very pleased.
They have to go, said Louis, with sudden determination, gesturing at the outside of the house with one hand. We don't want them here. It's not doing Mama any good, and it's not doing any of us any good. We're all going daft listening to it. Uncle James, who was invariably mild-mannered, sat bolt upright at this and flushed with anger. I suppose I should have known that it would come to this, he growled. You've all grown up without a word of the Irish, without a shred of understanding of the way things used to be or where ye come from. Ye think the whole world is dairy, or ye did until you moved down to Dublin. Now ye think the whole world is Dublin. It isn't, I tell ye. He looked distractedly around the room at the uncomprehending faces of the young Craigs. I always blamed your father, God rest him, for not giving you so much as an inkling of the Irish, for not telling you the old stories and the old ways in Donegal. If the truth were told, I blame myself too. I've spent most of my life trying to remember the old ways and the old language and teach them to young folk like yourselves, if it was only in the form of songs. We know a few songs, Uncle James, said Louis gently. He turned to Annie. Don't we, Annie? Annie nodded. She began to sing quietly. Sire, sire, banyan and Hogamar fain and sire, ling. Uncle James smiled sadly. It's a lovely song. You know it from my piano setting. He looked sadly at Annie. Do you know what it says, Annie? Annie shook her head. It's a song about summer. About the summer out in the country. His voice trailed off. He sighed and then shook his head. Oh, aye, he said. You know a few songs. But it's not enough, I tell ye. You. You're Craig's. Ye are somebody, or we were somebody, when we were out in Inish Keel, across from the monastery on the island that you cannot walk to once it is high tide. Now ye young ones don't even know who ye are. How can anyone not know who they are? His voice trailed off. Never mind, he said with a deep sigh. The thing has gone too far, and it's too late to mend it. What do you want me to do? Joe leaned forward in his chair. What we want you to do, what we need you to do, is to make the banshee or whoever is out there go away and leave us in peace. Uncle James nodded. He was still angry, they could tell. There is something I can do, though God knows it isn't often done. But ye had better be sure that this is what ye want. After this, the banshee will never come back. She will never keen a Craig again. Joe looked at the others, and they nodded. Then it's settled, said Joe, turning to Uncle James. Do what you have to do. We'll all help. And God knows we'll be grateful to you. Uncle James looked up. Have ye candles in plenty here? I suppose you do. I'll need candles. Joe went out to the kitchen and came back with a box of candles that was still almost full. Uncle James counted out nine of them. He put them in brass holders and distributed them in the windows of the house and in the death room, now empty. Dusk was falling outside. As he lit each candle, he recited a prayer in Irish. The prayer sounded to the young Craigs like the Our Father and then the Hail Mary and then the Gloria. In the meantime, the Keenan had started outside, but he just went on. When he was finished, he said to them, Let the candles burn all night. I will be back tomorrow night, and the night after that, and that should be enough, God knows. Now I will go, and ye can all go to bed. Again, he slowly drew the front door open, and let the light from the hall shine out into the garden. All was quiet. He took his stick and his hat, and he bade the Craigs good night. Now, soon enough, the singing started up again. <laughs> 
It was a chorus, all right. The three women were making harmonies as they sang. And sometimes one voice would sing against the other, as if they were disputing. It became gradually louder. It just went on and on. The young Craigs got up and went to bed one by one, in the hopes of being able to sleep. But there was hardly a night's sleep for any of them. The three women were keen and all night. The next evening at sunset, Uncle James was back, this time with a worn old book, which turned out to be a book of prayers in Irish. Again he lit nine candles in the windows in the death room, and as he lit them, he recited new prayers, reading them out of the book. The voices outside seemed to fade, Joe thought to himself, or was it just his imagination, or wishful thinking? But no, that night the Craig slept well, and Joe, who woke up a few times during the night, fancied that when he heard something outside, it was just one voice, keen and quietly. The third evening at sunset, Uncle James was back. He lit nine candles in the windows and in the death room, and after each lighting, he opened the old book and recited new prayers in Irish. And that night the Craig slept very well, and when Joe woke up during the night, as he had been doing for all the time since his mother had died, he strained to hear anything, a voice keen and perhaps, but he heard really nothing. He went back to sleep and slept soundly until morning when he was awoken by spring sunshine. That was the end of the Banshee and the Keenan. No more was heard around the house on Garville Avenue, and life returned to normal. Though one could hardly speak of it be normal. The house had to be sold now, and the young brothers would all have to find work, here in Dublin, or over in London maybe, or up in Derry. Even we Annie, who was only sixteen, would no longer be able to go to school, but would have to start earning a living, accommodated with some relative or whoever was going to stay in Dublin. Uncle James helped as best he could with the sale of the house, though the strength of the once vigorous teacher and musician seemed to have ebbed from him. He did not survive his sister-in-law for very long. Four years later, in 1934, he died and was buried beside her in Mount Jerome Cemetery. When he died, no banshee was heard keening. have been listening to The Banshee of the Craigs be Torlock on me from 13 Tales Told by a Dubliner